Hey everyone, this is Pete, and welcome back to Short Play, a series of quick tours of games I like on a variety of platforms, new and old. Today we're looking at G-Lock Air Battle. This was originally released in 1990 as a spin-off to Sega's popular Afterburner series of jet fighter games. I nearly called them Sims then, but no, they're very much not Sims. This game never really had a satisfactory home port, uh, partly due to the fact that the System Y hardware that the arcade machine was running on was so technologically superior to everything that was available in the home at the time, it just wasn't possible to have a good home version. The closest we got was the Mega CD version of Afterburner 3, which was actually a conversion of g -Lock's sequel. Just to get a bit convoluted there, but uh, yeah, there were some really dreadful versions of this, uh, particularly on home computers. There was a Game Gear version that was very good, but it was effectively a completely different game. It had been reprogrammed from the ground up to sort of fit the Game Gear and have its own structure and everything like that. So it didn't bear much of a resemblance to the arcade version at all. So, that original arcade version was particularly noteworthy for its elaborate moving cabinets. The most commonly seen one was one that could sort of pitch and roll all over the place as you were flying your plane around. But the most sought after top of the line model was called R360. It was found in a few select locations and it was effectively a large gyroscope that you sat in. You had to put a roller coaster style uh, shoulder restraint on uh, because the whole damn thing would go upside down. It was an incredible experience. It cost about three pounds for two minutes uh, in the Trocadero Center in Piccadilly Circus in London to play back in sort of 1990, 1991, when I had uh, the good fortune to be able to go and play it. But it was, it was worth every penny. It was a fantastic experience. So now in 2020, as I record this, uh, we finally have a good home version of G-Lock though. Sega recruited M2, the people who've been behind most of the recent Sega Ages releases, to port the game to Nintendo Switch. And they finally done the game proud, including a rather cool conversion of the moving cabinet. Not the R360 version, sadly, but certainly the, the pitching and rolling one of the original arcade game. So without further ado, let's go play G-Lock. Okay, here we are with g -Doc Air Battle, Loss of Consciousness by G-Force, the Sega Ages version for Nintendo Switch, uh, released at the end of April um, on Nintendo Switch by M2 and Sega. So, um, this is my favourite arcade game of all time, so I was super excited to uh, finally be able to play this in a version that didn't suck because believe me the early home ports of this were absolutely terrible i've played the atari st version and it's a monstrosity of grand proportions but anyway i'm gonna give you a quick tour of what this particular version offers you um we have arcade mode and ages mode um which are uh, ages mode is uh, kind of an a range mode basically where it's a series of original stages with a few tweaks to the mechanics as well and this is kind of a standard inclusion in sega ages releases from this point onwards as well they tend to provide you with a, a bit of a twist on the original game that often makes it easier in some way um but also offers you with just a, a different challenge as well so we'll have a look at that in a moment but we'll begin with arcade mode so um we're going to play in the moving seat mode, which is a simulation of the uh, original sit-down arcade cabinet for this game, which kind of rolled and pitched around as you were playing. And it's a surprisingly effective effect, um, as effects should be. Um, so, yeah, here we go. Let's insert coin and begin. So, how to lock on. We have to do you get a plane in your sights when locked on shoot your missile with the missile button and there you go so in in the beginner course which we're going to do here uh, you don't have to worry about throttle you just have to worry about using your vulcan cannon and your missiles so you begin with a carrier launch and we take off and off we go and we side to side and then the game's party trick which is zooming into the cockpit like this and then you're off so each level in g-lock um tasks you with shooting down a particular number of enemies uh, against the time limit and then um when you finish a level you get a flat increase in time of 15 seconds and you get up to another 15 seconds of time based on how many missiles you've got left so ideally you want to shoot down as many enemies as possible using your cannon instead 
Um, but obviously, your cannon being unguided, that's a little bit trickier to do. In these early stages, it's pretty easy. So um, what you can do is you can build up a really nice big time bonus in these first few stages and then go and blow it all on the later levels. Right, when the um, game zooms out of your cockpit like that, it means that there's an enemy on your tail. Uh, so if you don't do something about it, which mostly means uh, rolling from side to side um, until you go back into the cockpit view, um, you will get shot down. And that isn't a huge problem in this game because all it does is it wastes your time a bit. Um, so when you get shot down, you will just get straight back into the action after a few seconds. Uh, but when you are on a tight time limit, that can be a bit of a problem. So this is a tricky mission. You only have to shoot six enemies, but they're flying a lot more evasively than they do in um, other previous missions. You have to make a bit more of an effort to either hit them with your cannons or lock onto them with your missiles. Uh, and at the same time, you're flying down a canyon as well. Now this one, you have to shoot ground targets. Some of which are shooting back at you. Now in this one, you'll notice that when you press the missile button, you're firing off a whole volley of missiles instead of just one. Um, so basically what you have to do is you have to wait until you've got a solid lock on multiple targets at once. And that will allow you to destroy a whole cluster of enemies at once. And that is essential to success in this particular stage here. And also, you want to try and avoid that cannon fire that's coming your way as well. Because again, you'll get shot down if you're hit too many times. That particular mission there is probably the tightest in terms of time. You're likely to lose a lot of time on that one. Um, because at this point, you're kind of on the home straight. Oh no, I've been shot down. So you'll see there, it does just waste about three or four seconds for you to get back into the action which isn't disastrous it's not game breaking you can still clear the game that way um, but yeah ideally you want to avoid it because you want to save as much time as possible for these final stages because they're pretty tight as you can see <laughs> so in beginner mode there are eight stages altogether. Uh, I've currently got this set to play uh, just one credit because I've been trying my best to one credit clear this game. I actually successfully managed it earlier. I don't think we're going to do it this time. Um, but yeah, one of the nice things about this Sega Ages version is you can choose how many credits uh, you have available to you in this. So if you are taking a particular aim for a one credit clear or something like that, um, yeah, you can do that. You can adjust that. But there, I can't continue because I've got no credits left. So that is the basic course. And you'll notice um, throughout that that we could only bank up to 45 degrees at a time. Um, when we come on to the other types of mission that we'll have a look at before we move on to Aegis mode. Um, let's say there you are. There's proof that I finished it. Uh, yeah, when we look at uh, medium and expert mode. We look at medium first. Medium mode doesn't give you a tutorial on how to lock on because it assumes that you already know it. And you're straight into the action. So, just five enemies to shoot in this first mission. But you'll see already right from the beginning they're a lot more evasive. Breaking from side to side like that. Meaning that you probably, probably want to lock onto them. So the lock-on system, if you're having trouble telling how it works from uh, just watching what I'm doing. Basically, what happens is that that white sight in the middle, as soon as you get an enemy into your head-up display, which is the slightly darker square in the middle of the cockpit, as soon as you get an enemy into that, the white aiming sight will start moving towards the enemy. Um, and when they overlap, that is a lock-on. So what you can do to speed up the process is you can position yourself so that the enemy is closer to the center of your head-up display. So sort of being able to do that effectively and hit things with your cannons uh, is the essential skill to learn in G-Lock. 
The other interesting thing about this game is that the formations of enemies in each stage are fixed. They're not randomised at all, so you can learn them. So effectively, this game is basically a 3D shoot 'em up in the most traditional sense. So you can learn the attack patterns, you know what's coming when, you know what types of enemies you're going to be facing in each stage, you know when you're going to be facing a, a level that has enemies that will be shooting at you. And so you can prepare accordingly. But there's some missiles coming my way, so it doesn't matter though because we finished the level. Alright, on to mission four. A bit of cloud cover going on here. So obviously there's a few aspects of this game's presentation. They're a little bit janky compared to things that are doing things in proper 3D. But I still find this game incredibly impressive when you consider that it's doing everything using sprite scaling. There's no polygons in this game. Except possibly the aircraft carrier at the beginning. I think that's either constructed from polygons or it's a video sequence. I've never quite been able to work that out. Um... But yeah, this was this game was absolutely gobsmacking to be back in the day. This was the sort of poster child for why arcades were still superior to home video game consoles at this point in time, certainly. Because although the Super NES had the hardware that would have allowed it to take a pretty good crack at doing something like this with its hardware scaling and rotation the power just wasn't there to be able to throw that much stuff around on screen at once um and so yeah we never got a good home port of this until now which is remarkable when you think about it but i'm so happy this is finally here like i say this is my favorite arcade game of all time i used to play this every time um my family and i went on holiday to cornwall um we'd go to Newquay which is a seaside town mostly known for surfing uh, but i used to be really excited to go there because there was an arcade there and it had g-lock um, which meant that i would have the opportunity to sit in that cool cabinet and be thrown around by it which is super cool i was also fortunate enough on one occasion to go to the trocadero center in piccadilly circus in london which doesn't exist anymore um, trocadero is a weird place it was kind of a multi-floor I think it was a shopping centre. I, I, I forget exactly what what it was or what it was for, but I think it was a shopping centre. Um, but it had a huge arcade in there. I think technically it was a Sega World, um, but it had other stuff in there. Like it was the sort of place you'd go if you wanted to play the full size Ridge Racer cabinet in which you sat in the in the actual car and played on like a cinema screen with fans blowing wind in your face and that sort of thing and they had the version of g-lock that was known as r360 and r360 as i said in the intro um was a version of the game where you didn't go through stages like you do in this one uh, you simply had two minutes of time uh, to shoot down as many enemies as possible um but the unique thing about r360 was that you sat in a gyroscopic cabinet uh, it was it, basically just a giant gyroscope. And um, you would be strapped in with roller coaster style um, restraints on your shoulders because the thing would go upside down. And it ensured that you go upside down at least once by doing um, a large roll immediately after you take off. So if you were sitting in there and you were a bit nervous about. Um, about the whole going upside down thing as i was at the time because i'd never really been on a roller coaster um yeah it, it makes you do that right at the beginning of your experience so you can see that it's not too bad and indeed it wasn't it was a lot of fun and so by the end of your two minutes you're throwing your plane around the sky you're rolling it around all over the place and you're having a thoroughly lovely time but anyway um this particular variant that we're playing here this is the expert mode and the main difference in expert mode is that well there's two main differences one is that you can roll all the way around like that um and the other is that your plane doesn't auto center in the other modes you push the direction and you roll in that and turn in that direction uh, but as soon as you let go of the joystick your plane centers itself and goes back to level flight in expert mode that doesn't happen um so if you want to stop turning then you need to 
make it stop turning. <laughs> but there you go. That is the three modes you can play in arcade mode. Uh, beginner, medium and expert. And as you can see, they've all got a bit of a challenge to them, especially if you try and one credit clear them like I'm doing here. Now, what we'll do now is we will go back to the start menu after my ranking has been submitted. There we go. And return to the start menu. And we'll have a go at Ages mode. Now, Ages mode, um, it's the same basic mechanics, uh, but it's a custom course of missions designed specifically for this mode. And there's a couple of tweaks to the basic formula as well. So, one, you have more missiles in this mode, so you can get potentially bigger time bonuses at the end of a level. And two, um, you lock on much more quickly, which means you are using missiles is a lot easier and a lot more practical. So, let's have a go. So, you see, there's no difficulty selecting this one. You just start on the runway, prepare to take off, and off you go. So the other mechanics of this mode are based on beginner mode, so you can only bank up to 45 degrees. Um, which is probably for the best, because all the other stuff you need to bear in mind in this mode, yeah, plenty to worry about. So you see lovely big time bonus there. So we only started with 60 seconds on the clock, but we're now over 90. So I'm not sure how, how well you can tell how quickly that lock-on is happening now but it's it's almost instant in this mode whereas you have to wait for the site to move in the standard arcade mode all right two more to go we have quite high target counts in this mode as well so that's that's why um that additional time you get from the time bonuses is pretty important because you're going to need it when you need to shoot down 24 enemies in a single stage. That's also why the fast lock-on is enormously helpful there. So you see, that uh, that will allow you to shoot down like a whole formation of enemies. Uh, which simply wouldn't have been possible with the, um, with the lock-on system from the original arcade game. So we're at 16 out of 24 already. There's one. We are using a lot of missiles this time around, so we're not going to get a huge time bonus on this one. It's not bad. Could have been better, but not bad. Right, we've got a canyon mission. Yes, you can crash into the walls of the canyon, if you're wondering. Uh, this is one area where the game's collision detection is a little bit wonky. As you can see, you can basically fly through them um, until you are essentially colliding with the middle of them. So that's one area where the quote-unquote realism of the game... Whoops! Oh, you can do that. You can attempt to roll to escape an enemy on your tail and end up crashing into the walls of the canyon. Alright, not bad. So there are 16 stages in this mode. I think that's the same number of stages as uh, Expert Mode. But as I say, this is based on the mechanics of uh, beginner mode so it's kind of a mix of a kind of kind of a mix of difficulties so in effect it's probably a good way to transition from beginner mode uh, to the more challenging levels there's a bit less of a drastic whoops Slightly less of a drastic difference between them. I think our journey may be coming to an end very soon. Yeah, again, if you want to succeed in this mode, you do want to try and hit as many enemies as you can with your cannons. Um, as tempting as it is to use that super speedy lock-on... Now, interestingly, you can actually turn on the speedy lock-on uh, for the arcade mode. Uh, but if you do that, um, your score won't get counted on the sort of official arcade leaderboards. Um, it will be on the, uh, they call it the freestyle leaderboard. And again, this is um, the same for other Sega Ages releases. It, um, it has 
a sort of um I guess you call them regulated leaderboards where you have to play on certain settings. And then it has a freestyle leaderboard in which anyone playing with any sort of custom settings whatsoever uh, is all bundled together into one thing. So it's kind of meaningless, but it does al at least allow you to um, get your score or your time in this case uh, recorded on the high scores. Right, let's have one more go at this Sega Ages mode and then we'll wrap this up for today because I just love this game so much. This is just such, such a fun game. It's easy to understand. It looks great. It's exciting. I love the music. Oh, I just can't get enough of this game. We've got some weird colouring going on. I hadn't noticed that before. Was that deliberate? Hmm, maybe. Are we firing weird plasma guns all of a sudden? I don't know if that's a bug. Yes, I think that might be a bug, actually. Because if you look, all the all the planes seem to be funny colours as well. Yeah, that's interesting. Not like M2 to do a dodgy port. And to be fair, I wouldn't call this port dodgy in any way. <laughs> I suspect this is a problem that the original arcade machine would have had. If for some reason or another. But, well, we're stuck with it for now, so... I guess we're fighting the red arrows with our negative energy <laughs> missiles. <laughs> That's so bizarre. These things only ever happen when you least expect them, don't they? Back in high school. I had a friend uh, called Matt. I, I still speak to him, to be fair. Um, but, like, he, he, he will always be one of my high school friends. Um, and he was one of those people who, if there was a bug in a game, if there was some sort of glitch in a game, he would find it. He wouldn't be trying to find... Oh, wow, all the canyon size are inverted as well. <laughs> yeah, if there was a bug in a game, he would find it. Um, and yeah this is just reminding me of him I don't know how or why he developed that particular talent but whoops but he did if there was some way he could make a game go wrong or do something stupid he could do it often it wasn't even a bug like he, he was um when we were playing Resident Evil 2, we used to like uh, making Claire ice skate around the place, which you can do by holding down the run button and just tapping forward on the D-pad. And it just means that Claire never fully gets into her run animation. Oh god, this graphic glitchiness is awful, isn't it? <laughs> but yeah, it just, it just ne means that Claire never gets into her run animation. Uh, and it looks like she's sort of skating along the ground. And uh, any time we were playing Resident Evil 2 together... Because that was back in the days when we used to play video games together. Even single player ones. Ah, fond memories. Um, I guess it's no different from what we're doing right now, is it? But, uh, yeah. We used to play Resident Evil 2 together and it became tradition to move around in that way. Just because it was so stupid and silly and funny. Right, you know what? Um, because of that, the glitchy graphics there, I'm going to just take one more crack at arcade mode on beginner before we uh, wrap up for today because it's only a few minutes and I love it so all right beginner now I did manage to one credit clear this once earlier so I'd like to see if I can do it again and as I mentioned earlier the tactic you need to do for this is really knowing the levels knowing what to expect on the levels and being able to clear them as efficiently as possible. So that means learning the enemy formations, the best movements to do, when it's good to use missiles, when it's good to use your cannon. Um, and just trying to build up as much time as you possibly can in these early stages, preferably. So there we go. Net increase in time there. Keeping an eye on your radar is really helpful when you're trying to um, 
clear this as efficiently as possible because it gives a really good indication of where the enemies are coming from and how you will need to move in order to hit them or even see them in some cases. It doesn't give you an idea of altitude because altitude is important in this uh, but it does indicate uh, whether you need to head to the left or the right when you're trying to shoot something down. And you can also see when stuff is coming out behind you, the stuff that comes from behind you is the easiest to hit by far, especially with the cannons, because you'll have a short period when they are very much right in the middle of your vision. Um, but equally, you have to watch out for the the guy who appears behind you and starts shooting cannons and or missiles at you as well. And watch out for missiles, because they hurt. Okay, not going great. Not going great, but I've I've had worse goes than this. So this one, you need to head straight to the right to try and get those ones at the beginning as quickly as you can. Because otherwise they just weave back and forth and they're very difficult to hit. Get this guy down here, then immediately head over to the left to get these guys. That guy there normally just sails right into your sight as well, so he's quite easy to hit. Okay, coming into this ground attack mission with a good amount of time is essential. Because this is one of the longer missions and it's also one in which you're pretty likely to get shot down as well. So, um, you need to do this one as efficiently as you possibly can. There's a certain amount of luck involved in this. Like, you ideally don't want that to happen. But it's not the end of the world if it does. And again, you want to make sure you only fire your missiles when you're absolutely sure you're going to hit your target. And preferably multiple targets at once. Yeah, see, I don't think... I don't think we've quite got enough time to be able to clear this. Uh-oh, especially not if that happens. Yeah, that's not good. Huge waste of time. Five. Six. Yeah, it's not happening, is it? It's not happening. Oh, well, there we go. It was a valiant effort. And like I say, I definitely did do that. And there is proof on the high score table that I did that as well. So there we go. Anyway, that is G-Doc Air Battle. Uh, originally for arcades by Sega and now available on Nintendo Switch as part of the Sega Ages collection. As always, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you again next time. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please help out the channel by leaving a like or a comment and subscribing. Be sure to check out moegamer.net for new articles on Japanese and Japanese-inspired video games new and old every weekday. Every month, Moe Gamer features an in-depth exploration of an individual game or series as its cover game, so be sure to check the archives to see if your favourite has had a deep dive yet. If you'd like to support the site directly, please consider becoming a patron or buying me a coffee. You can find links to do both down in the video description. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.